if you're on social media and you're scrolling and you don't even know why you're scrolling, like you don't even know what you're looking for, your dopamine system has been tapped out. Andrew Huberman knows the secret that only 1% of the billions of people in the world know. And the key to it is dopamine. As much as one can get bright, natural, and if not natural, artificial light in your eyes early in the day, this sets in motion a huge number of different neurobiological and, and hormonal cascades that are good for you, reduces stress late at night, offsets cortisol, a million different things, really. Well, a lot of people say, okay, do I need to get into an ice bath? No, you need to get uncomfortably cold for 11 minutes a week. The American neurosurgeon suggests that by exposing ourselves to light, whether natural or artificial, early in the day, we can unlock our full potential. In the video, he shares some small but crucial tips to help us improve ourselves. What other secrets is he going to reveal? But now it seems everybody, including the elderly, understand that you need a combination of cardiovascular exercise and you need resistance training. I suggest people avoid layering dopamine. You know, you have one dopamine system that fortunately can be activated by a lot of different things. So for instance, I love the feeling of being completely rested, going into the gym or going for a run mid-morning after a cup of coffee, hydrating well, using the bathroom, listening to my favorite music on a sunny day. But that's a lot of things layering in for dopamine. And what happens is that if that becomes your hope and expectation, fine. But if that becomes your requirement for actually having a great run or workout, you're in trouble because the next time you're, it's not going to be that exciting and you're not going to be that motivated. You actually won't perform as well. Um, unlike email or reading an article online, social media is, you know, you can scroll through a thousand different or a hundred different contexts within five minutes. And that's a big override for the brain. And then the rest of the world seems kind of boring. I know many people are curious as to whether or not caffeine can improve focus and concentration. And indeed, it can. Engaging in cardiovascular exercise and resistance training are natural ways to increase your dopamine levels without relying on social media or mindlessly scrolling through your phone. There are many other natural and other healthier ways to boost your dopamine and live a fulfilling life. However, there is a potential danger that could cause you to waste a tremendous amount of time and negatively impact your brain chemistry. And that's not even the tip of the iceberg. There is an immense amount of data supporting the idea that caffeine, provided it's consumed in the appropriate dosages, can improve mental performance and physical performance. And it largely does that through improvements in focus and concentration. Regardless of what you've heard against it, there are many scientific facts that support Huberman's thesis about caffeine. There are also plenty of myths that the famous neurosurgeon can debunk today. Caffeine also have other additional benefits. In particular, the caffeine in yerba mate and coffee and other sources of caffeine are known to increase the density and efficacy, that is the number and the function of dopamine receptors. And this has been shown in humans several times. So by ingesting caffeine pretty regularly, you're actually increasing the ability of dopamine to have this effect of increasing motivation and drive. I tend to ingest caffeine only early in the day. I tend to cut off my caffeine intake somewhere around 1 or 2 p.m. to ensure that I can get into a good night's sleep. But I realize that there are people out there that ingest caffeine as late as 2 or 3 in the afternoon and can still sleep fine. I will caution those of you that think that you can drink caffeine in the evening or nighttime and still fall asleep. All of the research points to the fact that the architecture of your sleep and the depth of your sleep is disrupted even if you're able to fall and stay asleep, the sleep you're getting is simply not as good as the sleep you would get if you were to shut off your caffeine intake at least eight hours before bedtime and ideally more like 10 or even 12 hours before bedtime. So I think that, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago or even two years ago, I used to think, okay, like what's the workout split or how am I going to eat for the next couple of months? You know, what am I trying to optimize for? Is it muscle? Is it fat loss? Is it just maintaining? Is it energy? Is it focus? That's all fine and good, but sleep, nutrients, exercise, light, relationships, those really establish the foundation of what I consider to be all of the elements that create our ability to move as seamlessly as possible between the states that we happen to be in and the states we desire to be in. 11 minutes a week, divided up into a couple sessions of two to three minutes of deliberate cold exposure increases the density of brown fat in adults and allows them to feel more comfortable 
in cold temperatures when they're just walking around, okay? But also when they put themselves into this deliberate cold, and I'll talk about how cold in a moment, that then they achieve much bigger increases in core uh, resting metabolism, um, improvements in blood lipid, uh, blood lipid and, and insulin management profiles. And there's some other positive effects like improved mental resilience. So a lot of positive effects. It is not important how you get cold. You could even put ice packs on your on your neck or in your whatever in your your pants. Just get I mean, cold. People do that. Uncomfortable. Um, you get uncomfortably cold. How cold depends. And people always say, "I want to give me a number." Well, what's uncomfortable to you is not going to be uncomfortable to me, and vice versa. So, uncomfortably cold, and then the the key thing is that it needs to be safe, right? I mean, you're not gonna jump into 30 degree Fahrenheit water. You're gonna your heart will stop, right? So you you're going to try and get into chilly water that you want to get out but you can calm yourself and stay in for that period of two to three minutes these days i'm i have this obsession with trying to do one cognitively hard thing a day one and one physically hard thing a day now it does it not extreme physical not david goggins level workouts or anything but um i try and get my brain into kind of a linear mode i try and narrow that aperture so if I don't, the distraction that's created by social media and interactions with others can kind of wick out into the rest of the day. So I'm not necessarily trying to finish something in that time, but I try and do something challenging. If I was well structured in the early part of the day, it's that two or 3 p.m. The key is then to try and get something really useful done cognitively again. So some people might look at this and say, wait, you're working for an hour in the morning and 30 minutes here and an hour in the afternoon. When are you actually working? But it's really about the depth of the trench when you're working. And so if I'm going to drop into something again for a few hours in the afternoon, I'm really going to drop into it. And that's typically phone off and out of the room. And my goal is to get to the evening time so that I can do the things that I want. It's like how to get more focused. Okay, so we can talk about, you know, what do you take? What's the supplement? You know, but you have to say, well, how are you sleeping? Have you done any exercise? You really always find yourself or I find myself taking 10 steps back and then moving through the sequence of five things before you can even begin to talk about whether or not taking three or 600 milligrams of alpha GPC and how often to do that and does it work and yes, it works, et cetera. But those things really set the foundation. And so I like to think of those five things every single day. You have to re-up on sleep every 24 hours or try to. You have to re-up on movement every 24 hours. You can go a day or so immobile, but you better move the next day, right? Mm -hmm. And ideally you're moving seven days a week. You need nutrients, even if they come from stored sources, even if you're gonna fast. You're gonna fast for a day or two? Okay, fine. I've done that, I know you've done that. He's, I would put hydration under nutrients too. Mm -hmm. So you can derive nutrients from stored fat, protein, et cetera, glycogen. You're gonna need that every 24 hours. You're going to need sunlight, even if through cloud cover. And you're going to want to avoid bright artificial lights at night. Not every night, but most nights of your life. And then that relationships one is the one that maybe we can go into in a little bit more depth at some point, but it requires focus. It requires attention every 24 hours. Testosterone has some very interesting effects on the brain. The, the major mental effect of testosterone is it makes effort feel good. And the reason it does it is that the amygdala, this fear center in the brain, this anxiety center in the brain has androgen receptors. It has testosterone receptors. And so, it, it, the way this works in animals and in humans as well is that for most species, the males of that species never get a chance to mate. But if you think about animals with antlers, like rams, there's been a lot of research, believe it or not, on rams. They have to fight for the right to mate. Yes. And the fighting is a choice, right? And the decision to walk away is a choice, usually. They usually don't kill each other, although I know some of the injuries can lead to death. So testosterone, these surges in testosterone that happen seasonally in certain species like rams or even these little hamsters, the males will rip each other's testicles off in order to fight for the right to mate. So males of a given species have to actually overcome the fear of pain and punishment. And the surge in testosterone is what causes the shift to the willingness to engage in battle. Mm. And so when humans are taking low doses or, or reasonable doses of testosterone, or they're increasing their testosterone, or they're going through puberty, effort and leaning into pain and challenge actually has the effect of making the body feel soothed and good. It's a drive, just like sex is a drive or drinking water when you're thirsty is a drive.